All right, you're good to go. The meeting is called to order. Sarah, please call the roll. For the record, State Highway Commission is assembled at NDOT headquarters in Lincoln, Nebraska. The date is Friday, January 20th, 2023, and the time is 8.30 a.m. Copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted in the room. Commissioner Koppel. Present. Commissioner Fagerland. Here. Commissioner Gerdes. Here. Commissioner Hawks. Here. Commissioner Kindig. Here. Commissioner Leafgreen. Is trying to... Commissioner Leafgreen? Um, I'm trying to... He's on. <laughs> And Commissioner Wolford. Here. All right, we're good to go. I announce that there will be an opportunity for members of the public to speak at the end of the meeting. Next, we will have the minutes. Approval of the minutes of October 21st, 2022. Move to approve. Second. Motion has been made. Apple. Approved. Yes. Fagerland? Yes. Curtis? Yes. Fox? Yes. Kendig? Yes. Lee Green? Sorry, I'm good. Lee Green? <clears throat> Wolford? Yes. Approved. Next on the agenda are introductions and announcements. Are there any introductions to be made? Seeing none, we will move uh, to the director's remarks. Our acting director, um, Mo Janchini. Jill? Mo? Good morning. Uh, what a week so far it's been with all the work that the people of Nebraska, uh, Department of Transportation has been putting together. As we were talking earlier, all this week dealing with this huge storm we had out there, some places as much as two foot of snow, and they're still digging out. So. First thing I'd like to say, a shout out to all the folks out there for doing all the work and they're getting some uh, well-deserved rest today. So um, I just want to first thank them for, for all of that. So we have a new year and new governor and soon a new director starting for the Department of Transportation. So things are going to get exciting pretty soon. I understand next week the governor will do... Uh, his part for outlining um, his goals and his vision for the state of Nebraska. And I'm sure we'll all be listening to see what, what is in store for us. And uh, I have talked to the governor a couple of times so far. It seems like uh, uh, transportation is on, on, if not the very top of the list, is on his list. Uh, so we will be um, communicating with him very shortly as soon as our new director comes in to see what his vision is and, and learn from there and, and, and move on. Our new director, uh, Vicki Kramer, starting on Monday, uh, not new to the department. Most of you know her from the times that she was here as the uh, communication director. And um, so it's a relief to know that somebody's coming that knows us, knows our culture, was part of this this group and she wants nothing more to uh, nothing more than just making us all successful as, as what we're doing. I've had a few conversations with her already and I and I'm really excited about her starting on Monday. Our first day on Monday we're going to hit her quickly with a couple of things that she has to go to the Capitol and testify on uh, but we've been keeping her updated this week and, and last week so she should hit the ground running. And I'm looking forward for the next time uh, she's sitting in this chair and uh, she will tell you all about her vision and, and talk to you folks about what she wants to do and uh, introduce herself. So uh, looking forward to exciting next uh, few years of the Department of Transportation. Today I want to spend most of my remarks really uh, talking about some, some bills that are being introduce at the legislature and I'd like you all to consider following those uh, as the legislation hearings start. Uh, do we have some interesting bills uh, that has been uh, introduced so far? Of course yesterday was the last day that they could introduce any new bills so we got them all sort of 
looked at with not in many much detail, some of them. So our staff is working on to make sure we don't miss anything. But of all the bills, there are two that are uh, introduced by us, the DOT. And uh, one of them is LB 453, which is a, a bill that's going to allow us to be more um, engaged with, uh, with aeronautics. Uh, you know, when, when the Department of Roads became Department of Transportation a few years back, they added or we added the aeronautics to us, but there's really this big firewall between us is still where we really can't help them as much as we would like to. And that is uh, our budgets are just so separate. Even if we have to go over there and our crews have to fix anything on their buildings, we have to charge them. If we want to serve them in, in, on, in areas like help them with the human resources and things, and because we can't really invest anything in that group. So this bill will help us um, pay for or combine our budgets for the administrative part. You still are not going to get road money going to airports or airport money going to roads, but the administrative part where where, where their uh, their uh, where the issues are, we're going to kind of uh, combine those. So that'll help both agencies better uh, work together. The other one is the LB226, which streamlines our alternative delivery CMGC uh, by basically allowing the DOT to do a one-stop uh, kind of process. Right now, we have to issue an RFQ, look for contractors who are qualified, and then go for an RFP, then get for proposals. This allows the DOT to go ahead and go straight to the RFPs on, on some projects if, if we like to. So it's just a, a streamlining one. The other one is LB66. Um, Senator Slama bringing this back up again from last year. This is to allow the ATVs and the UTVs to be used on the state highway. Uh, we opposed it last year for obvious safety reasons. And uh, we're studying it this year to see what what our stance is. Um, basically, these these are small ATVs. They they have a really high center of gravity, and the tires that basically are designed to be off road. And then when you bring them and and commingle them with the high speed uh, vehicles on the highways, <coughs> they're not very easily maneuverable at a higher speed. So we worry about um about the safety so that's one of them there's a couple of bills that have been introduced to extend the county bridge match program this has been a very successful program uh for us um but it 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 ends in 23 so there's a couple of bills lb 124 and lb 449 um that will extend the to for about five, six more years. One of them provides additional funding. One of them doesn't, it just extends it. So we'll see how those two uh, end up. They, they might combine them, but I'm not sure. A Couple of other interesting bills um, that will give the DOT basically the guidance or, or how makes us uh, advance some of the projects. Uh, LB-212 and LB-454 are designed to prioritize uh, Expressway 70, uh, 75 and 81 um, and then provide some funding for <coughs> preliminary and design. And, and so 75, which, um, which is by Nebraska City, and, but this one takes it all the way to the border. And then 81, which later on, um, Don Knott will talk about where we are with it, um, prioritize that higher. So those are two interesting bills to, to watch for. Of course, uh, Senator Mosier has just introduced the LB-706, which um, provides the opportunity for the DOT to bond up to $450 million for highway work. Um, this is, uh, we've been there before where other bonding bills have been introduced. Uh, we haven't really studied it very carefully to see 
what all the strings attach on these are. But um, again, uh, another tool in our toolbox uh, if, if it passes. So Senator Mosher has, has introduced that. But I want to leave you with the most interesting bill, which I think it will be, um, I don't know how far it will get, LB 645, uh, which um, requires that DOT no longer uh, prioritize taking care of the assets we have first. You know, in the, in the law it says DOT has to, before we build any new ones, we got to make sure the current assets, highways and bridges and what have you, are in decent shape. So this one will take that requirement off. But more interestingly about this bill, it makes, it will require the DOT to identify how much revenues we get from each of the eight districts. Most of our revenues, as you know, is gas money coming from the, and then once we know each district, how much revenue DOT gets, we need to spend 90% of that revenue in that district. So if we get $50 million from District 7, then we need to spend 90% of that in District 7. I can't say spend any more any of it in other districts. So I don't know how that's all going to be uh, looked at, but um, that's going to be interesting. Um, other what, than what that, number was that? <laughs> I thought that would get your attention. <laughs> 645. Uh, but anyway, uh, that that's that just got introduced the last day, I believe. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how we we go after that. A uh, couple of other things uh, as far as um, workforce, uh, we still struggle at the DOT hire qualified people um, on all fronts. Uh, it's not um, just Lincoln and uh, Eastern part all over the state. Um, but in the last two major storms we've had, we've done uh, everything we can. We've been moving people from <clears throat> District 1 and 2 to District 7 and 8 if we have to, taking equipment, moving them all over the place uh, just to fill the gaps and giving people rest so we can, uh, we can take care of the business. Even with all of the challenges, um, you know, really my hat goes off to... These folks have been up 24, 30 hours in the last system trying to trying to help things out. In this last one, we opened the interstate late yesterday. I was trying to open it really fast so Doug can make it here, but uh, we had the, the wind kept blowing. New uh, areas were, were challenging, so we couldn't. Um, but there wasn't any report that I saw, any major incidents crashes or anything, uh, given this huge storm. I think that's a huge accomplishment for the department. Mm -hmm. um, under good news, you all know South Beltway is open, and I can attest, I drive it every day. I come from, uh, and few of us do. I just don't see any more trucks on this old highway to none. I don't know where, I know they're all down there. So this is a good example of you build it, they will leave. <laughs> And they left, so that that's all good. Um, and then uh, we have we have a really successful program thanks to all the folks in communication and districts that uh, I want to talk about quickly. <laughs> is our name is Snowplow uh, and a contest for our schools, and these kids are just doing a great job naming our snowplows. Some really funny names. And we, we go to their schools, and it's been a really good community um, engagement program for us. And uh, we, we probably have been to many of your schools uh, handing out some prizes to these kids, and uh, it's been really good. So with that, I, I always leave with uh, buckle up, phone down as you're driving, especially in this, in this weather. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Are, are there you, any questions for? Are you going to take the position, no. Bill, as a department? 
we will provide the facts uh, of how a network of highways have to be managed as a network, not as a district by district. We will provide all the facts. And uh, at this point, like I said, it was just given yesterday, and I haven't read all of it that cl clearly. When when the new director comes and we talk about it, I, I, can, I can't see that us being in favor of that, because if anybody knows anything about real asset management philosophy and techniques, is that you, you don't look at one piece at a time, you look at the whole network. And this will just, especially spending, tying our hands to spend X dollar <clears throat> amount on places, I, I just don't, don't see how that would work. But I can't tell you what our official position will be yet, but I would, I would have a hard time at this point, based on what I've seen, support it. Is this a, I don't remember, is this a short session, 60 day, or is it a 90 day session? Well, I think it's 90 days. Long session. 90. This is the long session year. So I'm just looking at our, our next meeting until March. I mean, this is going to, uh, this would be terrible for the state. I mean, it, it may be great for Lincoln and Omaha, but you're going to, Kill everybody else, and, and the commission can't sign on. So I, I don't think we can sign on something like this. I think what would be beneficial here is if we had access to what are the revenues of each district. And that that would give us an idea how it impacts not only my district but everybody's. And, and uh, but does it matter? If well, if you have a need, if you have a need in a district. And it's it's based on now you got a terrible road. That road's supposed to bubble up to the top. Doesn't matter where it is, right? Based on this I understand that, but isn't there a bill also that says preservation's the first priority throughout? They took that priority out. They, they took that priority. I I I'd, I'd like to see <laughs> exactly how this impacts each district. We we will in the next few weeks. Um, First of all, Sarah, can you send them the actual language of this bill? We'll, yep. we'll send that to you to read it. I, I wouldn't get too excited about it just right now because, um, first of all, we don't collect revenues that way. Um, we, we buy district, and I, that would take a, a lot of time just to get to see which gas station is where. We get a, get a sense of uh, what, how much money each gas station brings to the to the table, that would be difficult. The next thing is federal funds. Are, I don't know if it's even legal for us to take the federal funds and dedicate it to certain geofence of the district boundary. There's just so many technical things that I think <clears throat> are, are in this bill that I, I, I don't see it going anywhere, but uh, we will we'll update you. And at some point, you know, when, if the hearing is set up, um, I don't think there's anything preventing you from testifying at all uh, and telling your constituents' point of view as well. So I, I think this is a this is a bill that I think somebody quickly put together without really thinking too much. Mo, this is Jim out in North Platte. Yes, and I have to agree with what they're saying. Uh, you know that would be a really bad deal for district six up here if if we started doing that where we have a lot of the sand hills areas the other thing that i have for you this morning a question and i visited with gary i know that you're down in manpower i i realize that you know you have priorities on the interstate or whatever but i have to tell you that i have been getting a lot of calls from the custer county area and Gary said that you were bringing in uh, people from other districts to help them up there. Um, I guess my only th thought would be is if there would be a way that you could mobilize those people <clears throat> quicker uh, to get them up there. Just while we've been on the meeting here, I've got two more calls that I didn't answer, but they're also coming up from that Custer County area. And I realize they got almost two feet up there, but... Uh, those cattle feeders, you know, they really need to get to their cattle. 
Yeah, yeah, very, very good points. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this one storm was was really a big one because it covered, I would say, maybe 60 to 70 percent of all Nebraska. Um, so we're digging out everywhere. Uh, District 3, District 4, District 6, District 5. And so we are mobilizing some some teams probably from District 1 and 2 and part of maybe even 7, even though District 7, they got about 9 inches or 2. In the last storm, it was more uh, concentrated in the Cherry County and all that. And we were able to send a lot more from the east to west. And we'll do the best we can. In fact, this morning, the team is, is prioritizing and assessing to see what we have. Um, I'm expecting a couple of uh, um, declarations by the governor and some of the those counties you're talking about. Uh, we can't go help the counties unless there's an emergency declaration by the governor's office. And I expect that maybe to come soon. Once that happens, then we provide some resources to those counties like we did on the last storm. Um, the counties don't have the size and the, 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 the capability of blowing the snow that we have. We have major equipment that can help with that. So we're, we're working, we're doing everything we can. We're talking to the county superintendents and see what needs they have. Um, but um, we'll get there as soon as we can. Yeah, uh, I, and I know you will. And but the complaints I've been getting Mo, have been on the state highway system, not in the county. Uh, and I know you're up, you're against, you know, the same thing all over. But uh, apparently, Custer County feels like they're being neglected. Yeah, yeah Custer County, in most places by Broken Bow, and those places they got upwards of two foot of snow. And some of these highways are, uh, we need to mobilize blowers there. It'll take take some time, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll get there. And, and I'll take your message uh, to the team right after this and then get an assessment to see where we are. Thank you, Mo. And if you'd give me a call and just kind of let me know what the results of that meeting is. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are there any other questions for both? I, I have one back to the ATV, UTV <laughs> on the highway. And, you know, if this doesn't pass, reality is every one of my constituents in agriculture is illegal. I mean, it's whether they're using their, their ATV to check systems, check cattle, they're on the highway with them. And, uh, you know, I, I could tell or I thought by the tone of the voice that the, the uh, DOT may have a negative or not be uh, wanting to promote that. I just want to let you know what really goes on out there in the, in the rural areas. So. I, I appreciate that. In fact, right now, the, the, the farmers and ranchers are allowed to cross the highway but not be on the highway. There are some jurisdictions, cities, some counties actually allowed them um, on their highway, on their streets, on even some, some places on, on county roads, um, but not on the state because um, when, you know, we're all about safety and we know, we tell people <laughs> don't drink and drive and they do. We tell people buckle up and they don't. But we have to, we were trying to tell people that even the manufacturers of these vehicles, the, the first thing they tell you is do not drive them on pavement. These are not designed for pavement. Those knobby tires and things are, but they do. And, and some of the people I know they do, but we just don't, I don't think we want to be in the, in the, be promoting it. South Dakota allows it on their state highway. And we've looked at their statistics. And since they started allowing the state of highway, they they have problems. They have their fatalities gone up uh, tremendously. Their major injuries are up 172 percent on these people, especially the UTVs, which they're a little bit bigger. They bring some, they have some uh, passengers, and they might even put something in the back and and, and uh, haul it. So 
they're just not safe for the state of highway. Do people use it? We know they do, and they're supposed to cross the inner highways. Some of these highways don't have very many cars, so they get on them if they stay. I mean, people do what they do, but officially, I can't. At this point, we, we don't think we we can be. Um, I understand your statistical, and what I am saying is it's, it's going to happen. And the other question I've got is, is, is what's the approach of the DOT that these vehicles then use the ditches? Is there an alternative? Drive in the ditches. Which they do. Which they do. Drive on the right of way and on the shoulder. We have to think about that. I don't know. We got our, our public design engineer here. He's, he's saying he probably does it himself. <laughs> <laughs> he did. No comment. <laughs> well, well, my point is, my yes. point is that I think we have to, okay, statistical manufacturer says don't do it. Reality says it's being done already and it'll continue. Can I, can I chime in? Sure. You know, I mean, we have the duty and the responsibility to design our highway to, to meet certain standards and the same thing for the ditches, for the back slopes, four slopes. So we, we have liabilities <clears throat> when you allow somebody to use your facilities and you haven't designed it for that purpose. So the purpose really for the ditches and some of them even wetlands, we can't just quickly say you can do it. So either we do design a trail or facilities to accommodate, but just to say to people, go ahead, drive where you at. I mean, that to me is you bring in liability to the agency or to the state because of that action. So I think it's a different purpose. I think we really need to study it like Director Tamshidi says, we got to understand the impacts and how we facilitate this carefully without imposing any more liability on the state. But your point is well taken. We we know some people use it some places, but as long as we're not, we're, we're on the record saying it, it's not safe and that that's, that's what we do and uh, we design them accordingly. So um, we'll see how this bill goes. Last year didn't come out of the committee. Uh, it was, LB 110, I believe, and um, there was a lot of good questions about it. Uh, one of the interesting questions was, um, if, if these get into some kind of an incident and they get into an accident with a car, and um, even if it's the car or the truck's fault, um, the, the, knowing the manufacturer of these products, they do not drive on highway, even if they are allowed on the state highway, I don't see how anybody can go and, and claim damages if they're driving something that someplace where they're not supposed to. So it, 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 they're different than motorcycles because people in the, in the bill last year, they said, well, you allow motorcycles. Well, they are more maneuverable. These things, one more quick at a 50 mile an hour, uh, a high center of gravity could be a problem. But again, um, what we're... we're Safety is our thing, and uh, we don't think these are designed for the highways, uh, but we can't prevent people doing what they do. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> if not, we'll proceed on the agenda with the 23-24 uh, Highway Commission meetings calendar. Sarah? You should all have a copy of it in your folders. Um, and Apple will be free and Hawks received it yesterday. So 2023, we had tentatively already uh, approved the dates last year, but the locations, March would be in Omaha, June would be in Ainsworth, um, August, North Platte, and October would be in Holdridge. It would be our four out of state meeting. Um, otherwise, the other ones would fall May, September, December, as per usual. So that is the 2023 calendar. 24, this is just tentative dates, just in case 
a meeting gets canceled again in December. We have a tentative January date, um, but it falls in line with our third Friday of every month. So take a look, if you guys are okay with this, I just need a motion to approve. Move to approve the 2023 calendar and the 2024 tentative dates. Second. Mr. Koppel. Yes. Fagerman. Yes. Curtis. Yes. Fox. Kindig. Yes. Lee Green. Yes. Wolford. Yes. All right, those two are approved. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the election of the 2023 commissioner, chair, and vice chair. Um, Sir, would you give us the history? There, yes. So, as follows, um, next in line, if we continue with our regular um, transition, Commissioner Koppel would be 2023 chair, and Commissioner Kindig would fall into 2023 vice chair. I'll make a motion that uh, we nominate and elect Commissioner Koppel as chair and Commissioner Kingding Kimdig as vice chair. Second. Commissioner Koppel. We vote since we're nominated. All right, never mind. All right. <laughs> You're approved. Congratulations, sir. <laughs> Not moving it too far behind. All right. Okay, I'm ready for the next. Okay, next on our agenda is the U.S. Highway 81 quarter update with Don, not our project studies engineer. It's not. Thank you, Commissioner Curtis. Appreciate the opportunity. Hello. All right. Uh, Dr. Mo, commissioners, it's been a while. It's a couple of familiar faces. I appreciate that. A little background on me. I've been uh, with the state for a little over 30 years, and I was 15 years in our road and design division where I managed a number of these expressways and had quite a few presentations to the Highway Commission back in those days. And we had a lot of design as a capital improvement projects. I then went and I worked 15 years in our consultant services and agreement section where we hired a number of consultants or partners in designing various types of highways and environmental services, bridge, uh, you name it. Uh, also wrote a bunch of the agency agreements, whether it's with the locals when we do roadways through the cities or with border bridges when we do our Missouri River bridges. Anyway, when Khalil asked me to make a presentation, I thought, and he's blowing off the dust on this little geezer here because it has been over 10 years since I made any kind of presentation. <laughs> and so you just have to bear with me as I, as I muddle through this. Dilly dilly. <laughs> <laughs> So right now I work with uh, in Brandy section project development. Work with Todd Hill in project studies, and uh, this short uh, Columbus corridor is one of the projects I'll be managing. In this presentation, I will present some history on this corridor and part of the expressway system. <coughs> some of the things that we're planning to study and design, and some of the challenges that we will run into when we proceed with this project. Up is up. Okay. Side. Which button? Here it is. <clears throat> the US 81 corridor from Kansas line to Norfolk is part of the 600 mile expressway system in the 1988 Clover study or expressway study. This is the map showing the expressways. As you can see, most of them are on the east side of the state, but there are some on the west, um, 71, which is north of I-80, and Highway 26 around Scotts Bluff is also part of that expressway system. The York to Columbus corridor is blocked off there in red. This 
This 2022 updated map shows that a number of these expressways have been completed as shown in yellow. Segments one through four and six as shown in green are under construction or under contract. I apologize that the colors are pretty close to the same between the yellow and the green, but you at least see the associated numbers on the map. The rest listed in red and green or red and blue are funded for planning and design. North of York and South Columbus, segment nine, is the remaining segment of necessary to complete the US 80 and corridor and has been funded for design. Mm -hmm. I can do it for you if you need to. The corridor study was completed in 1985 for the York Columbus section. It consisted of constructing a new four lane facility with bypasses around York, Stromsburg, Osseo, and Shelby. It ended at the junction with Highway 64, just south of Columbus. <clears throat> Construction of the York Bypass was completed in 2008, and the 2011 passing of the Build Nebraska Act has provided additional funding for the expressway system over a 20 year time frame beginning in 2013. I've got this now. Yeah. Takes a while. Okay, the York to Columbus corridor is over 40 miles long. It goes through a number of cities, impacts ag land and other environmental resources, businesses and homes. Therefore, we will have a lot of public and interest, interested parties. We're currently in the midst of a study to identify a more cost-effective alternative to the 1995 study by using as much of the existing two lanes practical two lanes as practicable, that's a hard word, to construct a four lane divided facility using the two plus two configuration. Part of the two plus two philosophy is maintaining as much of the existing lanes as possible and to avoid or minimize any crossovers by constructing the new lanes predominantly on one side. If we construct new lanes on one side for a distance and then shift over to the other side, it requires removing a bunch of the existing pavement, building new pavement, and shifting traffic from one side to the other. This is not cost effective and also causes kinks in the highway alignment. We can use the entrances and exits to the cities, though, as a natural transition for building on one side to the other. An exception to the 2 plus 2 philosophy is the three lane urban sections we are proposing to construct in Stromsburg, Osceola, and Shelby. We are currently, currently designing alignment alternatives, preliminary design, excuse me, and performing preliminary design. This would be for determining which side of the road that we're gonna build the two additional lanes and some of the intersection alternatives that we're looking at that I'll talk about later in this presentation. We are identifying impacted environmental resources <coughs> and we'll create a matrix of alternatives and associated impacts to assist in our selection of a preferred alternative. From all of this, we will prepare an environmental assessment, and once approved, we will prepare the final plans. As I previously stated, we will be using the two lanes by using as much of the existing two lanes and constructing two additional lanes, providing for a 54 foot median. This rural four lane section is similar to what we've recently constructed on US 3 to 5 south of Alliance and on 275 from Scribner to the West. We will be using the same on US 275 from North Fork to West Point and from US 26 and L62A from Minotaur to 3 to 5. As a cost savings measure, we are proposing to eliminate the bypasses that several communities have proposed in the 1995 corridor study and constructing three lane urban sections through Stromsburg, Osceola, and Shelby. We will include curb, gutter, storm sewer, and sidewalk. In fact, the construction of the Stromsburg project should be constructed in the next two years. Besides being a cost savings measure, communities typically have not supported bypasses as they feel that if we bypass their community, 
it will affect their economic vitality. But in the future, if it's determined and necessary, uh, the state can build those bike lessons. Here is a list of some of the challenges and potential conflicts that will be considered during the design. We will go into a number of cities with highway junctions, specifically the east and west junction with Highway 92. We have multiple access points. And hydraulics will be a challenge as a lot of some of the project is in the floodway and the floodplain. Some potential conflicts listed here include an electrical substation on the west side of the highway, two miles north of US 34. We have a hog operation and then there are other farming operations. And of course, we have homes and buildings throughout. I will address some of these. The west junction of US 81 and 92 is located two miles <laughs> west of Osceola, and the east junction is located approximately two and a half miles east of Shelby. The junctions currently consist of T intersections with free right turn movements. We will conduct intersection alternative analysis at the east and west junctions here. The design needs to minimize impacts while maximizing traffic operations. The alternatives being studied here include maintaining the existing T intersection, constructing sweeping curves to maintain free flow for US 81 or roundabouts. Top picture shows a roundabout alternative at the east junction. Top right is a sweeping curve at the east junction. The bottom right is for the west junction. And I got that backwards. The north one's on the east and the bottom one's for the west. Happens. So some things that we don't think about is transitioning from a four lane to a three lane. Design alternatives also need to be considered when transitioning from a higher speed four lane facility to the lower speed three lane urban section. This is a specific curve, specific concern. <coughs> the west approach to Osceola and the south approach to Stromsburg, as we have many <coughs> items that need to be considered. The highway is in the floodway and floodplain at both Osceola and Shelby. We have drainage issues. There are adjacent properties and businesses. We have a private golf course entering Osceola, as shown in the top picture and a campground and park entering Stromsburg, shown in the bottom picture. We need to determine the optimal location to make these transitions while minimizing impacts. What I need is a clicker to turn pages. <laughs> Rural accesses. We have multiple accesses along the project to residents and to businesses. And it's another important component of highway design. We have to provide accesses to all properties, but to increase safety and reduce costs, we have to limit the number of access points to the highway, <laughs> limit full access that require medium brakes, and minimize frontage roads. To reduce the cost of frontage roads, we will be providing right in, right at, right out, right right in and right out accesses where we aren't providing medium brakes or accesses directly on. Cross County High School is located at the junction of US 81 and Highway 66. There is concern with students entering a high speed roadway. We will be studying a few intersection design alternatives, which include the standard intersection, a roundabout, and an R cut, which stands for restricted crossing U turn intersections. I don't know how familiar you are with the R cut analysis. I do have a graphic here at the bottom. <clears throat> um, at an arc at intersection, left turn movement off the highway is allowed, but the cross traffic or left turning traffic onto the highway is prohibited. So to continue the crossroad or turn left onto the highway, one would need to turn right, get into the left lane, and make a U-turn, and that's shown by the blue car. If anyone's interested, I know the state has made a two-minute video uh, driving through the new one they've completed at Humphrey. Um, it's on the news and media page under transportation tidbits. And I thought it was very informative just to see how the vehicle moves through that. 
There are a number of bridges and culverts along the project, and some of them are in the floodway and floodplain. When we have a roadway improvement that's in the floodway or floodplain, FEMA requires that the improvements do not raise the water surface elevation in the floodway or raise the water surface elevation over a foot in the floodplain. In addition to FEMA's requirements, we have to be concerned with water overtopping the highway. Typically, we design to a 50-year flood event, which means a flood has a 2% probability of occurring in a given year. When we design our highways, we design the highway elevation and size the drainage structures such that the water in the design year event doesn't overtop the highway. As part of the alignment alternatives, the state consultants are conducting, conducting extensive hydraulic analysis in concert with the design. This is a floodplain map in Osceola. Davis Creek parallels the highway on the south and crosses the highway twice through town. As I noted, we typically design to a 50-year flood event, but since in Osceola is only meets a 25-year flood event, it's decided that we will just design this section to a 25-year. If we did design to a 50-year flood event, there would be extensive impacts east of Osceola and in, in Osceola, <clears throat> as we have a number of businesses and homes that would be impacted. And we also have a railroad that crosses and parallels the highway through town that would also be impacted with a higher design. Currently, there's frequently water on the highway in this area, so anything that we can do will be an improvement. I know this is very technical, but I wanted to indicate that there is a lot of stuff that goes into the design and alternative analysis as we work on the project. Osceola will definitely be one of those areas that will be a challenge. We are currently looking at three alternative alignments and cross-section designs at Osceola. We could extend the existing three-lane section further west out of Osceola. We can build the additional two lanes to the north, or we could build the two additional lanes to the south. Preliminary indications from the hydraulic analysis we've completed so far is that the new highway elevation would be, have to be higher than the existing highway elevation. We will continue to assess this area and determine the best solution. Other challenges, I have three slides here that just kind of briefly show some of the other challenges that we have. This is the power station on the west side of the highway. We have a hog operation to contend with. And there's homes and businesses, and we have a few railroad crossings throughout the project. The bottom right picture shows a picture of the new bridge, and then there's a railroad crossing and a crossing street in the middle of it. So that gives our engineers a lot of things to consider as, as we design that section. The existing cross section, the existing cross section is strong for the two main rural section, the shoulder. They do have some curbs and some sidewalks as shown in the picture. <clears throat> An improvement project to be constructed in the next two years will consist of constructing a new three-lane urban section with new curb and gutter and sidewalk and include an overlay of approximately four miles of US 81 north of Stromsburg to the N92 junction. Similar three-lane sections will be constructed in Osceola and Shelby. <clears throat> We've hired a consultant team to assist the state in the preparation of our design plans and environmental assessment. Benish is our lead consultant, and then our HDR and FHU will be assisting them. Each of these consultants will have a segment of highway that they will be providing the roadway design services on. HDR will be the lead on the environmental services and preparation of the environmental assessment, and FHU will be doing the traffic studies for the entire corridor. So this will give me a lot to do in the next few years, coordinating all these aspects internally and externally. For this corridor, we are working on the environmental assessment and preliminary design. If I <laughs> some of the environmental resources that need to be investigated include such things as wetlands, hazardous materials, TNE, 
uh, historical properties, parks. A matrix of impacts will be developed from the alternatives alignment designs and the environmental resources to present the public and assist in our design decision making process. We will conduct frequent coordination meetings with our consultants, with FHWA and other environmental resources. We will hold public meetings and meet with our stakeholders. In fact, our first meeting will be later this year. From the alignment alternatives, environmental impacts matrix, coordination meetings, public meetings, we will select the preferred alternative. Once the environmental assessment is completed and approved, we will prepare the final plans. We anticipate completion and approval of the environmental assessment in 2025. At that time, there will be multiple construction projects programmed <clears throat> based upon the availability of funding. At this time, I mean, this concludes my formal presentation, but I'd like to show a drone video that was created along this 40 mile corridor. It's uh, long, so I did clips. Uh, but one thing I noticed the drone itself also had kind of some jumps in it. And since I'm showing clips, there's a few jumps. But I'm hoping uh, as we go through here, you can just get the gist of, of the whole corridor. Well, unfortunately, sometimes I'll have to go fast and sometimes I'll have to go slow because it's just the way it went. Are you clicking start? You want me to start it? Yeah. This is nice and nice. So this is coming out of your northbound. You can see the electrical substation on the right. And they've stubbed out lanes on the left so that we can tie into those with our new project. The bridge will have to buy, build a companion one with our new lanes. We've got power lines that run on the left side. We will impact wetlands, drainage ways, and other environmental resources throughout the project. We have homes and businesses on both sides throughout. We have a lot of ag land and pivots. Right here, there's a pivot well on the right that we'd have to contend with. And there's that small substation there on the left. Four houses, ag land, pivots throughout. We'll jump three miles north here in a second. We're still going northbound. We have a few detention ponds on the project that we may need to be relocated. There's that hog operation on the left. More farming, more wetlands. There's a home there at the end of the hog operation on the left. We will then jump seven miles to the north to just south of Brownsburg. This is where we get into the floodplain and floodway. There are homes on both sides. We cross drainage ways. We'll have to construct new bridges. We cross through a park, which has a trail running under the bridge up the trail, it's the highway on the right. The railroad crossing is the start of the end Stromsburg project and will be constructed over the next two years. We've jumped five miles north, which is the approach to the west junction of US 81 and 92, where we'll be looking at intersection alternatives. The video will then head eastbound into Osceola. The highway crosses the floodplain here at that bridge, that clump of trees we're just passing. On the right, just past the curve, you will see a business. This will be impacted if we construct a larger sweeping curve to make US 81 a continuous movement. As we continue on the approach to Osceola, you will see a drainage way, which is in the floodplain, approach the highway on the right side and parallel the highway. <laughs> This one mile segment entering Osceola is where we can see that the alternative alignment design is to minimize impacts to the floodplain and address overtopping the highway. We could either extend the three lane section further out of town, construct two lanes on the north, or construct the new lanes to the south. Going to the south impacts the floodplain more, but we have the house, and we have a business and golf course coming up here on the left. Davis Creek continues on the right, and you can see some of the ground doesn't have a good crop due to the standing water. There's that golf course there on the left. We're pretty much within the floodplain as we exit Oxiola on the east end. 
As we enter Osceola, we have businesses on the right. There's a bridge, railroad crossing, and street all bunched together right there. Coming out of Osceola, we have a vet hospital on the left. And there's an intersecting street coming in on a curve that we'd have to tee up while minimizing impacts to that vet hospital. Now we've jumped seven miles eastbound. This is the approach to the east intersection of US 81 and 92. The video will go through the intersection and then jumps to going northbound. We have power lines on the right, more pivots there. One of the intersection design alternatives is to make US 81 the continuous movement. You will see in a minute as we proceed north that we have a railroad crossing and a communications tower. These would be impacted or need to be considered during the design of the project. In the last eight miles of the projects, we have more ag land and pivots and wetlands and less residences. We've now jumped to the end of the project at the intersection of N64, where we tie into the existing four lane rural section at Columbus. NUT is committed to delivering this project and with the help of our consultant partners. We will continue to look for efficiencies, minimize impacts, coordinate with the environmental resource agencies, and engage the public. Do you have any questions? Do you have questions, I, Mark? I have one. Are you going to change the name of the, pro of the project now? <laughs> well, it's no longer an expressway. You're, you eliminate the bypasses, so you're not building an expressway. You're just pouring the highway. I'm very serious about this. I, we're, if if we're if our target is build an expressway, you have to build the bypasses. Well, we've been. I'll take that. That's not you. <laughs> Hopefully, we don't get that coffin fit here. Um, you know, obviously, we discussed this multiple times, commissioners, and we recognize the the original 600 mile expressway. As it was established, included bypassing towns for maintaining the, the number of speeds. The agency find themselves not able to meet all the different demands trying to complete an expressway system when we have 60 to 100 million dollars of additional cost every time we bypass a town. And when we go to public involvement, everybody in town do not want us to bypass. And you know, you know, at the time we built some of those bypasses around some of those towns, we still had the same criteria, but businesses was established in a different way. I still lived through those around Geneva and Strands and McCool Junction and all that. And so given all these different stats, we believe in order to make progress, we need to complete the four lane capacity with some of those miles and transition into towns and wait for the traffic demands and wait for all the different things to where we have a better justifications to go in there and complete that. So at least it's uh, making the progress to get where we need to, to accommodate a lot of these different demands that the legislature and everybody else in the communities expect us to finish. <laughs> and then uh, see what we need to do on those passes around towns. And that's really the, the best approach from the agency at this point. Otherwise, we will be 50 years from now still talking about it. It's just, we need to show those progress and uh, we're not able to. You know, Jim. Yeah, um, I've been I don't know how many meetings on this uh, with uh, constituents, and so forth. Uh, but one thing, and I I think the the urban three lane, in my opinion, is wrong. Um, and number one, it's supposed to be an expressway, but we're going to. There's a lot of truck traffic, and if it's built right going to take impact off of Highway 30 from Grand Island to Columbus, which if you've ever traveled that two-lane highway, it's ridiculous at times. And I see the trucks going right up I-80 to the 81 junction and taking that expressway. Uh, I see trucks on the expressway when they hit York instead of taking I-80 and going through Omaha to catch 29 to go north will continue if we ever finish this project. And I think we need to look at what would happen if this was constructed as an expressway. Uh, I think it's going to impact a lot of other areas as well. 
Uh, and I think it's a mistake to try to go through the towns. I really do. Uh, and that, that's my opinion. And I'm sure that when we start having public meetings, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, resistance from uh, a lot of uh, different things uh, on this whole project. And this thing's been delayed ever since I've been a commissioner, so um, which hadn't been all that terribly long. But uh, I've been in meetings where, um, you know, the, the public thought the right of way was already taken care of with stuff. And it's a wonder I didn't get tarred and feathered out of that meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's a lot of controversy here. Here they really do want this expressway. Uh, and I think if we construct it properly, I think it's going to benefit the state of Nebraska uh, a lot more than maybe what we're seeing right here. And, and I, I really think going through the three communities, uh, especially Osceola, uh, I, I can't even uh, visualize how that actually will work going through Osceola. The way you come down, you've got... Uh, it, there's just a lot of constraints from from my opinion, and there's going to be a lot of truck traffic. It just makes sense to keep coming and, and going north uh, if that's where you're going. So those are the things I see. I I would just speak from experience. Um, when when we built the expressway. Um, in Kimball, we did um, build um, a bypass. And I can tell you from traveling it, uh, most of the people still drive through Kimball and don't use um, the bypass. So just from experience, I think um, you're on the right track. I think to, to say this to the to the commission, I mean, we're committed to the public engagement. We're committing to go and talk to folks. Um, you all experienced the Lincoln South Bellway. We, we had four lane facilities. We have all that. So we went to, to, to complete that. And it's $352 million to take that type of things. So commissioner, I don't disagree with you. I don't disagree with the intent. The agency have been studying this and trying its best to make the, the you know the, the progress that people expect us to make, but did every time you go through around communities and uh, you know you have to come up with a hundred million dollars to do that, it's it just going to delay us further. I think to me is a, it is trying to make that incremental improvement and trying to work toward the completion of the expressway. It's always going to be the six hundred mile expressway, Commissioner. I mean, it's just and someday hopefully. Probably not in my lifetime, but it will be complete. And I think it's we need to study all these different demands. We need to understand Highway 30. We have we have planning, you know, approaches on those. Whether we consider Super Two, whether we can consider other facilities that are already designed, a team is is assessing all these different things. Is like Mo said earlier, you know, we look at this as a system, and we're trying to do the right thing for our users. Uh, given what we are allowed to, you know, in terms of budgets and federal funds to try and execute this. And uh, that's where we get caught. You can see that this is, it's not a simple 42 miles. This has got a lot of stuff and we're trying to do our best to make that kind of progress. And I will just assure you, if we start talking bypasses in three communities with this, it's another 20 years before we even can turn dirt. And I, that's not same same groups you sure. included would tell me that's not the way to do it and so i think it's um communities don't want us to go around and, and i agree with commissioner lee green because we struggled through kimball bypass we struggled and we delayed it and we delayed it and when we finally made the call and we build it and if you'd like to go drive it it's 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 a four lane with five cars uh, so it's probably not fair but it's uh Still, people want to go to the town, gas up, and grab some food and things like that. And uh, when we bypass towns, we're not able to just barely move around the town. It's quite a bit of bypass. It's away from the town, and sometimes it depends on the terrain. You may not even see those towns. 
so we're, we're, we're trying to balance all these different demands from the communities, from the leaders, and adjust that with our budget and ability to move projects forward. Could, what, would a, what would a super two highway look like on this project? As long as we're going outside of the box, let's go there. And, and is that at all feasible? Uh, if we're going to change, what I'm sensing here, we need to change what the terminology really means of this. Uh, so what would a Super 2 highway look like? Is it feasible there? Uh, if, we're, if, if it's all about money, and, and I'm not... I'm not that uh, familiar other than the, when I come to Lincoln, the only stretch of that road that I used would be from Columbus down to, it's at 92, I think, yeah, 92. And there it goes from a four way into a two lane. It, it, it's not a big inconvenience for me. So what would it look like if this whole thing was just a super two highway? Uh what, one thing we need to consider also, the, although these were all designated as a four-lane expressway, uh, a couple of things. One, that they, they weren't really designed as, uh, designated as freeway, which means no access. So they're, they're just, they're still four-lane expressways. And the thing we also look at, especially in 81, on a 20-year a trajectory of the traffic bill, you know, if it's gonna be over 10,000, it requires a four lane to accommodate the the traffic that that's going in there. So some areas might get there sooner than others, but a super two, um, like we're we're going to be doing some of those on the rest of the Heartland, uh, North of Alliance, and other things. That that's more, I think, uh, suitable for the kind of traffic that we expect. Eighty one. Uh, as, as we said, once you build a four lane north to south, we expect the growth of traffic. And that's what I think Khalil is saying. Some of these are small towns right now that, that if we bypass them now, that you, you, you totally bypass the town. Um, if one of this is four lane in the next 15, 20 years, they might require a bypass. Some places may, some places might not. Uh, that's the time to build them. So I don't think Super Two for eighty one is is would would fit. But but our our experts are here. They can tell you about the future. But ADT and the number of traffic that that drives us on the number of lanes first, uh, and then we will go from there. So do you think if we have this tra traffic transition on eighty one, build the four lane and it's going to come. So now, after this is completed, are we going to be at the table saying, okay, it's got to be completed from Norfolk to the South Dakota border? Well, the designation is right now Norfolk South, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know. Those are good questions. We built some <laughs> four lanes and we want to see how they, they perform through the years and, and how, how the traffic growth happens. You know, you can sit down right now and speculate. If you build the four lane all the way to Norfolk, the traffic will grow. Well, it'll be four all the way to Norfolk. Right, right. It will, the traffic will grow. Um, to what level? I guess time will tell. And I wouldn't be surprised that someday north of Norfolk is, is, is a four lane all the way to South Dakota border. So, uh, but it's premature to, to, to speculate all of that now. And so we just got to wait. Uh, until that day comes. Okay. Or a good commissioner, because we have different you know, group that came and wanted to do the four lane on 35 to South Sea, because that's what they see the corridor to be. And I think it's just us studying and, and understanding the traffic demands at that time, but the expressway system <clears throat> is designated with those 15,000 population connecting to the interstate but it also told us to pay attention to socioeconomic impact, pay attention to all different things. And so I think that's part of the equation. All of us understood that expressway to be four lane at a certain speed from this point to this point. That's not really true. It's a lot of decision that was taken and a lot of understanding with the Highway Commission uh, to come in there and determine that we're going to maintain that 
that four lane facility with high speed from those towns. And you saw that on Highway 81 south of York. Uh, we did not violate that concept. We just kept bypassing and bypassing despite all the, the demands and all that. Um, I think it's just the, the, the prices and the costs and all that. I think we have to balance the <coughs> traffic and the expressway system as designated as was, you know, carefully uh, laid out earlier. Just one more question, I'll leave you alone, okay? But if I understand this right, our philosophy is, is okay, we're gonna drive these trucks through these communities. Eventually, they're gonna get tired of it, and if we got the money, we're gonna go around, right? Is that kind of what the philosophy is? <laughs> That's what it sounds like, and I mean, if it is, it, tell me I'm wrong, but. No, I, I, you, I would say it in a different way. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you wanted to quickly I'm say. I'm going to add to it. Yeah, you, you'll add to it, commissioners. But what I will say to you is we have currently existing highways going through towns. And most of these towns are operating at a level of service that is acceptable. So as a, from an engineer perspective, we are trying to provide the capacity and and the, the address the things between towns that connect these two to two areas, but it's still we're not operating at a dysfunctional or a, you know completely collapsed approach in terms of level of service. Do they slow down? Yes, uh, but we're not having major congestions and major safety problems through towns with these trucks. I, uh... So when there's a growth, that's what the agency will continue to monitor and will come in. And when we meet a 10,000 projection traffic with the traffic of the trucks, we're going to have to program these projects accordingly and fund them. I, I, can, I can kind of agree with what the thought process there, no matter what we call it. And, and let me give you an example. I'm, I'm relatively confident if you went to O'Neill, Nebraska, now you're going to have businesses, you're, I want to say, but the individual stakeholder, the after going through two and a half years of the of the wind tower farm being located there, I think that community would more than welcome to be bypassed, uh, other than the commercial business, but the public is general. And and the point I'm making here is just that that we, I want to make sure we are including all the stakeholders, not just the vocal few that it affects uh, when we make these decisions, because there's a, there's a huge separation between the private stakeholder and the commercial stakeholder in these small communities. Point well taken. Yes, and that's 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 the team. That's what we do. We go out get all the input for all of these projects. Uh, but the bottom line is, bypassing any of these towns will require us to have so much justification to overcome a lot of the environmental requirements. If we're going to go out and we're going to get into the floodplains and do a lot, impact a lot of wetlands, do all of that it better have a full support of the community. Otherwise, our alternatives, it's not gonna to come to the top as far as uh, the environmental impact it concerns. They're all gonna be federalized. So we, we can't, in, in, if, if the traffic is not there, the communities are not supporting it, but we still wanna have this major environmental impact by going around the big town on all these grounds that are going to have all kinds of issues that we have to deal with, that would be a tough sell. So uh, someday when the traffic is there, when the community's telling us, get out of here, and we have good reasons to impact these, uh, <clears throat> you know, deal with the impacts of these environmental uh, challenges, I think it will be a lot easier to, to sell the project. We don't have any criteria with that traffic would be what it would be before. We have some ideas. We have some projections, and um, projections are, are projections. So as Khalil says, right now, these towns are handling the traffic that's already on there. And we feel like at the time, by 2025, when we get to some kind of a plan and some kind of idea exactly whether we're at 
three lane or four lane through town or whether the outside the town will have a really good idea at least for the next 10 20 years what kind of growth we're going to get because remember this is all happening at the time where we have highway 30 is going to be all four lane from omaha west we're going to have 275 most of it is going to be four lane 77 by the time getting in the middle of this. So the, all the distribution of traffic and trucks north-south, it, it, it's not an easy one to predict. So we're gonna have to kind of wait and see how that goes. I think our design will be adequate to take us at least for 20 years after we build this, and then we'll kind of continue to monitor. It's good to understand what the thought process is here. I, I get, you know, I don't want to move forward with this project based on what I said, that's for sure. Um, I, I just know there's going to be a lot more truck traffic. And uh, uh, I think even going through the, the three towns uh, is a workable situation. I mean, you wouldn't want to just not do it. I think it will pull. Uh, a lot of the trucks off of Highway 30 from Grand Island to Columbus. Um, and I, anything coming up 81 that's headed north are going to go that way. Uh, and we we'll certainly need to get from Norfolk all the way up to Yankton. That, that needs to be done too. And, and then you do have a north-south uh, equation for all these trucks coming out of the south. And, uh, you know, I, I see more truck traffic creating the problem that uh, cars and so forth. And in regard to uh, the Kimball, uh, very few trucks are going down through town. They're taking the bypass. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as we watch I-80 with the amount of truck traffic, uh, and we certainly don't want to uh, take them off of I-80, the economic impact from these trucks coming uh, east and west or west and east across Nebraska, uh, it's it's made Nebraska. And I think the economic impact from a clear route from north and south uh, uh, would really expand <coughs> from the truck stops and the truck traffic. They're all going over to 29, going over to Kansas City, taking 29 up uh, into Sioux City, Sioux Falls, and, and beyond up into Fargo. This is a direct route. Uh, and, and I think it's important that we, we take a look at that north-south. So whatever we can do to accomplish this and get it started is great to me. Um, and I, I think we will, we will really see uh, a lot of impact this will have, regardless of which, which way it's built. I really do. Thank you, Jim. I think it's it's time that we probably need to move on, but I'd like to make one quick comment. I'm, of course, you know, I'm from Southeast Nebraska, and I think once we had I, Highway uh, I-29 on the uh, east or east side of the Missouri River, then we opted in Nebraska to four-lane Highway 2 so that the truck traffic coming up from the south, from Kansas City, in other words, they wanted to come across to hit the interstate, but they didn't want to drive up to Omaha and hit the interstate. And so then we four lane highway two. But as a consequence of that, we had all this truck traffic going through Lincoln. Well, pretty soon the people in Lincoln, they didn't appreciate all this truck traffic. And so now we have the South Lincoln Beltway. So I think we do need to pay attention on truck traffic as Jim told us. And as these projects are done and intertwined and traffic starts moving in a different direction with these trucks, I think we need to, you know, do the best we can to see what we think might happen with this. So anyway, with that, we'll uh, head on to our next presenter, and it's um, Nebraska Electric Vehicle Infrastructure, and we have Mr. Brian Pop, our presenter. Hi. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Of it. So yeah, today, um, my team and I have been given the responsibility of um, taking over this new program, this federal funding program called the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. It's a new acronym that you can take home with you. We call it the NEVI program. I'm going to give you an overview of some of the, the, the basics of this new federal formula program. 
along with some of the activities that uh, my team and I are engaged in doing this. So um, you, you obviously, all of you have sort of seen the headlines about the new bipartisan infrastructure law, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, whatever you want to call it, lots of new funding, lots of, lots of excitement, lots of headlines. Um, you see in the, the top left some of the some of the headlines coming to Nebraska, $1.2 billion in new funding. Um, more recently, you might have seen the, the other two headlines that are kind of listed in the, the bottom, um, talking about this new program called the DEVI program, Money for Electric Charging Stations. And so, um, obviously, uh, this is a new thing to us. It, it, it's never something we've never done before at NDOT. And so... Um, we've had to spend uh, the last year kind of getting ourselves oriented to this program. It's, it's brand new, still, you know, a lot of, a lot of guidance that's still forthcoming on this program, but there are some basics I want to kind of cover with you today. Um, just kind of let you know, as, as you get questions, what, what this funding is intended for, what the restrictions on it are, what we've been doing. And so it starts with kind of the basics of the program. So as you read the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, they talk about this program, um, the purpose of, of, creating this, it's, it's create this national network of electric charging stations. And so as the industry and the consumer start to sort of shift towards electric vehicles, there's this desire to create a network of chargers across the nation uh, to support sort of nationwide travel using electric vehicles. So, you know, the, the local driver, they're going to charge in their, their, dri their driveway or their garage at night. But what about the driver that's traveling across the state? And so um, for Nebraska, um, you might have caught the, the headline in the, in, on the, per, the previous slide. This, this is a formula program. We're getting about $6 million a year over the five years of the program. Um, and it's an 80-20 program. So for those that are interested in using these funds and constructing charging stations, you're going to be required to come up with 20% of the, the, uh, the funding for those things. So that's just the program in a nutshell, but there's many requirements that come along with this program, and, and some of the, I'm not going to cover them all. I'm going to cover the major ones. One of the first ones is that uh, where can we put these? Well, the, 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 the law says we have to first put them on what's called alternative fuels corridors. And what is an alternative fuel corridor? This is a designation that the federal government sort of allows states to put on various highways. Um, it was it was it's it's intended for users of these alternative fuels vehicles. These are just kind of some of the, the electric, electric vehicles, obviously, are one of them, liquid petroleum gas, I'm not gonna list them all, but uh, there are these different vehicles out there. And in some states, there's a lot of these vehicles. And so there's a need for you know, the state DOT to sign and give sort of indicators where these fueling stations are located. And so there's a process that you can go through to sort of designate these highways or these corridors, these AFCs, I'm gonna, that's, that's the second acronym today, AFCs. So we have to build on Nebraska's AFCs first. And so in Nebraska, those AFCs are I-80 and then US-6 between Gretna and Lincoln. And so um, having only just a few AFCs in, in my mind is somewhat of a good thing because this just requires you to build out on all your AFCs. If you're a state that invested heavily in AFC designations, you're gonna have to go to those first didn't designate, you've got the flexibility of going wherever you want after those AFCs are built out. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. The funding has to be used for what's called DC fast chargers. So um, if you're not familiar, there's different levels of charging. The first level is the one you kind of see at your home that you kind of get a full charge after a whole night of charging. The second level is the one you see at the high V's and the, you know, the downtown garages and things. Those get you a full charge after maybe two to five hours. But for, for this program, these have to be the, the, the fastest of all those charges, the one that deliver the most power, um, just because of the, the convenience needed when you're traveling long distances. You don't want to be sitting at a stop for five hours to charge your electric vehicle. So all of these, whatever we build, has to be DC fast chargers. And that comes kind of at an expense. I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, the other requirement is that if you were to build these, you have to build four of these DC fast chargers, and each of them have to deliver 150 kilowatts of power. If you're not in the electrical business, you know, just rest assured, that's a lot of power. I mean, some, some of our public power folks are telling us this might require, you know, substation, things like that. So these are, this is not, this is not like a small investment. These are, these are large investments. In fact, some of the equipment dealers that we've talked to, um, not depending on the right of way requirements and, and power requirements, building new power, these things could cost a million dollars a pop. So we're talking very expensive 
very intense amount of power for each of these, these locations. And so that's what we're required to do in this program. Um, I will mention that there are still a lot of, I mentioned it earlier, a lot of forthcoming guidance, ongoing rulemakings. Federal government wants these to be uniform as you travel from one state to the next. And so they're kind of identifying what these equipments will look like, what kind of features they'll have. And so when you go from one to the next, they all look the same. Um, I mentioned the AFCs earlier. Um, when you build out your AFCs, they have this requirement that you must put these deployments one every 50 miles. And so, um, you know, in, in Nebraska, you, you know, you're looking for where these are located. There's a few already out there, these compliant DC4, DC fast chargers with the satisfy the power requirements. Um, but there are some gaps. And the other requirement is that when you build them at that 50 mile mark, you, can know, you can't build them more than one mile away from your exit. So if you're at York, you can't go farther than one mile off the interchange. So that's what we're required to do there. Um, the next one, um, you must be publicly accessible. Obviously, for obvious reasons, if they're taxpayer dollars, you can't just put them somewhere where at nighttime it's gated up and you can't get to them. So um, there's a lot of questions that can these be put on private property? Yes, as long as the public has access to it 24 seven. So these can be put at the high these these can be put at fuel retailer centers, um, so on and so forth. So, um, and another one is, is equity. Um, I, I bring this up just because it's, it's, it's something, a, a new emphasis area with, um, within the bipartisan infrastructure law and, and a lot of new grant programs. In particular, um, you've heard of maybe Justice 40. It's, it's a new sort of executive order that sets a goal to pass, pass along 40% of federal investment benefits to dis disadvantaged communities. And so that provides kind of a, I don't want to call it another hoop to jump through, but it's another thing we have to consider. So, you know, intuitively, we just put these chargers where people are and, and where they're going to get the most amount of use. But there's this other lens we have to apply to where we put these. And so we're still having to figure that out, what that means, what that looks like, how we, how we define that and capture that. So um, something we're, we're, we're working through right now. And then just the last, the last requirement I wanted to highlight is that we have to do a plan every year. And so the first plan was, put, was sort of published back in August, and, and that's available on our website. If you just Google NDOT NEVI, N-E-V-I, you can find those things. And it tells you a little bit more about this program. So um, that plan that we put together, it, this is just a broad overview of just kind of the, 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 what the elements of that plan. Obviously, um, we have to talk about in our plan how we're going to how we're going to go about deploying these. What is the what is the what are the requirements we're going to put to put where we're going to put these? That kind of thing. We also need to define sort of what is the state of electric charging in Nebraska. How many electric vehicle owners are there? What are the sort of contributing factors to where you should put these these EV stations? And then lastly, um, just well not lastly, but the identifying the locations. I mentioned that. And then the program evaluation, how are you going to set up your um, sort of monitoring and, and, and make sure that you're delivering on the goals of your plan. And throughout that, we had various stakeholder engagements. We have, um, we talked with, like you mentioned, fuel, fuel retail centers, public power, um, you know, various public interest groups, things like that. They, they, all of them sort of contributed to sort of what's located, what's built in that plan. Um, just, just a couple highlights from that plan. This is just a breakdown. Um, I think you can see that. That's just a breakdown of um, currently registered vehicles that can actually plug into a charging station in Nebraska. Is this useful? Maybe, maybe not. Um, is there is there going to be an upward trend in EV adoption? Maybe. Um, but this at least gives us a sense of where Nebraska is at. I mentioned earlier, this is a nat meant to be a national network to support sort of national travel. So whether or not folks from our districts use these you've seen, but that just gives you a sense of what I figured you might want to know what EV adoption in Nebraska looks like today. Um, moving on, I also mentioned that there, there's this requirement every 50 miles within one mile. Um, so we obviously, there's a very simple exercise you can do once you locate those compliant chargers out there, you just put a 50 mile bubble around it. And if that bubble extends to encompass the next compliant charger, you satisfied your 50 mile thing, your 50 mile requirement. But in this case, there's only a few of those bubbles that actually overlap with the adjacent pre-existing compliant charging station. Uh, there are a few gaps. You can see those kind of vertical red lines. Those are kind of gaps we've identified. And so 
just to cut to the chase, to build out our AFCs in Nebraska, the first places we will have to go to put these is these cities, Kimball, Sydney, Great Springs, Gothenburg, Carnegie, York, and Omaha. So um, those are the places we have to go first, and that's the, where we're gonna be sort of building these first. After that, we have the flexibility to put these where the customer wants them, where it makes sense, where it fulfills the requirements. And so um, currently we're focused heavily on, you know, getting these, these locations um, sort of to the front of the line. But I guess one thing, if, you, if I haven't sort of alluded to it already, you know, Nebraska is not in the business of running gas stations. We, it's not, we don't have a business model for that. And so we decided very early on, along with all the other state DOTs, um, we're not going to run, we're not going to own, operate, maintain these charging stations. It's just not what we do. So we're, we're working to pass, we're going to be working to pass these on to the private sector. There are people with business models that that do this every day, that, that, that know how to make money off these, know how to operate and maintain them. And so uh, part of our plan was to develop a draft framework to get these, these fundings into the private sector's hands to, 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 to build these things. And so this is just a broad overview, very draft framework that we pr were proposing in our plan. Obviously it's about identifying those locations, developing kind of your, your charter and your criteria. And then it's moving into a kind of some sort of solicitation, invite to bid where, you know, charging station operators come and say, hey, I've got a great location. I can, I can fulfill your location here. I have a plan. I got, I got amenities, those types of things. And we look at it and say, okay, how much money do you need? And we just, we just look through all those things and we move on to the next one, just re review and score those, those proposals. Eventually, if we select them, enter to some sort of agreement where they're sort of on the hook to, to deliver throughout the life of these, the, um, these equipments, and then move on to construction and then project monitoring. Um, how are we gonna define, <clears throat> decide winners and losers as I, I call them? So like, there's a lot of interest from these. We get, we got, we got car dealerships calling us. We got fuel retail centers calling us. We got guys with vacant land calling us. How can I, how can I get some of this, this funding? Well, you know, it's, it's gonna boil down to the proposal you bring to us as, as, as we see it. Obviously, location is, is going to be huge. What is at your location? Do you have power? Do you, you have sort of something nearby for people to do? Um, how much money are you going to need to do this? Can you fulfill that 20% or are you going to make us fulfill that 20% requirement? So um, all things we're going to have to consider. Um, there's obviously, there's some sort of requirement that I didn't mention earlier that these things are, have a 90% uptime. So they're, oh, they're, they're available to the public without, you know, being broken and whatever. So you have to talk about how you're going to operate and maintain these, your commitment. Do you have staff or contracts with people to service these things? Um, and then I mentioned earlier the amenities. If people need something to do for 20 or 30 minutes if they're going to charge their car. So we're going to be looking at these things as we engage with the private sector to, to, to have these things built. Moving into 2023, where we're at today, um, I mentioned earlier that the plan just put together this framework. There wasn't a lot of details because of the, the short timeline we had to put that together. So currently we're developing those details related to how are we gonna make the, the, con, the private provider fulfill NEPA requirements, this Justice 40 stuff. Um, so, so we're working through those details with our legal department. Um, and we're also gonna be working with our stakeholders to make sure those things are actually feasible. Because if we put something out and say, we're gonna have to have you do this, and they say, we can't do that. Well, then we're back at square one. So we need to make sure we're going through a request for information process right now with, um, or put, about to put that out for folks. Um, also putting together details on those scoring criteria. We have a draft list. Uh, we need to start sharing that with our, our, our private sector folks so they know what we're going to be grading them against. Um, also putting together just sort of the, you know, <coughs> the operating sort of requirements, you know, in our, what, this is the agreement we're going to have you sort of sign when you, when you take this money. Um, so finalizing some of those details currently. And then we're going to be putting this, this program into action, putting, you know, some sort of proposal, request for proposals, invite to bid out on the street. And then lastly, updating the statewide plan. I mentioned the yearly requirement to update. We'll be adding a lot of these details in, in this, by the end of this year in our, in our plan update. Uh, and then the lastly, this is just kind of a, a very broad timeline of, of where we plan to go with this. Um, so we're starting that, um, I guess that, that, that first S is kind of where we're at right now, sort of engaging with stakeholders. We're starting to organize regular meetings with public power, um, putting, we're going to be putting out this RFI that sort of says, 
hey, this is the detailed agreement language. Can you live with this? Can you do this? Um, what should we change? Can you, you know, so that's where we're at right now. Later this summer, we hope to sort of begin to advertise these things. And then by the end of the year, kind of make our first awards with respect to, you know, who can, who wants to do this. So um, that's the goal. That's where we're at today. Um, today, just broad overview of the Navi <coughs> program. So stop there, see if you have any questions. Jim? Uh, where's Wyoming on this, on the I-80 corridor? Um, well, I, we would have to, but the, I think Kimball, we've, we've talked with, we, were we talked to talk with our adjacent states. I don't, I haven't been part of our, the specific conversations, <clears throat> but um, our NEBI program manager, Curtis Nozzle, who's here today, um, has been working with other states and that, that I think it's that Kimball was the furthest to the, to the, to the west. Um, obviously, we've had to coordinate with them on what logically where they're going to put theirs. And so that's where we found that we need to put ours. And so states have to talk to each other. They have to look at where the next logical 50 mile location is on their AFCs and work with their, their adjacent states. If I may. Yeah. Commissioner Kindig, we've talked with Wyoming and they are committed to putting one in Pine Bluff, which is about as friendly to us as you can get because it's right at the border. So we can go 50 miles in, which would be Kimball. Get to Kimball and you can't go west. <laughs> well, well but yeah, we, I, yeah, I understand. I'm yeah. just, you know, the, yeah. the point is, and the same way with Big Springs, uh, Sterling's the next. Yeah. You know, that's a long way, yeah. so. And then there's a, there's a fascinating thing about, about that, and um, Ryan didn't mention that, you know, the AFCs have to be built out. He, gave, he listed the criteria every 50 miles within a mile. There are some states who simply cannot achieve this, so, you know, places like West Texas and right. in, into Wyoming and whatnot. So there are opportunities, you know, Washington has signaled that there will be opportunities for relaxations. The interesting thing about what we have with Colorado is we have a situation where um, Colorado plans on putting one in Julesburg, and we plan on putting one in Big Springs. Now that's about 10, 11 miles apart. Um, well, I want to talk and coordinate with Colorado as well as Washington about this because um, I want to make sure that they're okay with this just because I just think from a, you know, a wise spending of the dollars, you know, having two of these stations 11 miles apart in the high plains of, you know, eastern Colorado and western Nebraska, is that, is that, what, is that what they're targeting this money for? You know, I mean, that's, that's low population density, right? You know, so is this what they want? Is there an opportunity for relaxation there? How would we work that? Um, there's no resolution yet. It's just to let you know that we're, you know, it's on our radar and we're, we're looking at it. But the other question that I have, uh, and I've, I've talked to some uh, gas stations and so forth, some sea stores. But what have we put together any kind of an ROI to the operator if they put in a, a station? Because there's got to be some return on their investment, and their investment can be anywhere from the way I understand it, two hundred and fifty thousand more or less dollars, and to entice somebody to put this station in, there has to be some type of return on investment. And I, I don't think I've ever, you know, I tried to put that figure together in my own mind and I don't have enough facts to be able to do that. I mean, there are there are owner operators out there that have found a business model that does work. And and, and so obviously I mentioned the RFI, that's part of it. You know, what 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 would you need? Is, is Does DOT have to foot that 20% bill? Do you have to have us, you know, provide funding for operation and maintenance of these things? We don't know what what is feasible. So so we're you know we're in that boat trying to figure that out right now. So it's it is a it is a concern. Um, you know, a charging station in a very rural area isn't going to get the traffic and the charges and the in the money like it will on eighty. So you know we've got to think through those things and make sure we're putting together a package that's appealing to someone who wants to bid on this or, or make a proposal on this. So it's a good, I think it's a great point, so. Any other questions for Ryan? Yeah, I, I have one. Um, in terms of um, the revenue that's 
coming to NDOT from these charging stations, um, how is that going to impact our revenue? We will not be receiving any revenue. I mean, this is we're 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 trying to you know we're giving them eighty percent of the this, the funding to build these things with the hope that they will be able to make money for themselves in the back end. So it, this is not about we will not be receiving any of the revenues related to the charging. So mm -hmm. uh, there are some bills introduced. I think. I'm sure of at least one that might address this. Um, they're looking to charge kilowatt hour taxes, I, I believe like three cents or something that that will help come to the come to us for those that they don't use uh, fuel. So there are some moves in that area, but we're not really part of that. Uh, if it does, it's just going to come to the Department of Revenue, and they will deal with that. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we'll move on to the public input. Um, are there any letters for the record? If so, please hand them to Sarah at this time and, and uh, she will read them. Okay, if there's no letters, uh, we, is there any presenters from the public? Uh, if so, come to the podium, spell your first and last name for the record before speaking. And I did leave a copy of the short presentation. And you guys have been here for quite a while. I'm sure you'd like to move on, so I'll make these comments brief. And uh, uh, I would mention you guys talk on the big issues. I'm talking about a very specific issue, so I don't want to bore you. And obviously, I should probably be directing more. And I have directed attention to the District 1 office over a number of years. But uh, again, uh, Deputy Director, Commissioner, thank you for this opportunity to address you. Uh, uh, my name, is, I'll, I'll try to follow the written comments, but obviously I'll make some uh, uh, up-to-date comments as I go along. My name is David Anderson. I reside at 42401 Southwest 61st Odell Road at Odell, Nebraska. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a has-been uh, government uh, person. I guess being a has-been is better than never was, but I'll go ahead and say that I did serve for 16 years on the Gage County Board of Supervisors, 11 as chairman, and five as a road and bridge chairman. So I've always had a really strong interest in interest in roads and how important roads are to the development of our communities in our state. I'm also just another has been official. I did serve at one point as past president of the Nebraska Association of Counties, NACO. So uh, along with being born in Crawford and having a lot of interest in Western Nebraska, I, uh, I'd like to pay attention to what's going on all across the state. And I've been very interested in your expressways, both the ones from Alliance North to Rapid City and 81. And I would encourage you to, to uh, uh, keep doing all you can to promote those expressways. They're going to be important for the state. Again, I, uh, I get off my script here. I'm appearing here today to speak in favor of safety improvements to the intersections of State Highway 8 and 112 and the Village Odell's Main Street as well as with the County Blacktop Southwest 61st Odell Road on the southwest corner of Odell. These two exits to the village of Odell are one block apart, so they are close to each other. And I would also mention that about 30 years ago, I was somewhat instrumental in getting Highway 112 to connect with Kansas. At that point, we had three mile stretch where the uh, Nebraska highway system did not interact or connect with the Kansas highway system and their their road was 148. So we did work with the state. We did get the three, three uh, actually three brand new miles that were township. Dirt Road actually turned those into state highway. And with that, we have really seen a big increase in truck, semi-truck traffic. And so that's kind of one of the reasons I'm here because it has really become a safety issue uh, that plus a couple of the supplementary documents that I have here uh, follow up the remainder of my comments on the first sheet. 
uh, in 2019, I worked with the Gage with the uh, Odell Community uh, uh, Town Board to develop a resolution that was sent up to you folks. And uh, my indication is that that uh, the town board uh, doesn't recall getting any, res any response from the board or the director's office on that resolution. So I'm kind of here to to re renew that this has been an ongoing issue with the uh, Diller Odell consolidation of schools. There's been a big increase in youth traffic uh, at the at this intersection I'm talking about. Plus the uh, the railroad is has left the Odell community. So everything goes out of there by truck and the farmer's co-op elevator is a rather large elevator now. They, they keep building these giant to concrete bins. So there's a tremendous amount of truck traffic entering and, and uh, departing on that, that intersection that I'm talking about. So far as safety improvements, my first su suggestion would be a lower speed limit on Highway 8 and 112 past the village. In addition to a turn lane, for the Main Street and the Southwest 61st Odell Road, which is a county blacktop road. A detailed memo sent to NDOT officials recently, and this was a week or 10 days ago I sent this, is attached to these comments as well as an area map. And I think, quite frankly, the area map didn't get included. I apologize. My understanding is that an overlay project is in the works for this section of Highway 8112. It appears to be in the five-year plan, but not within the next two years, is my understanding. My input is that this would be an ideal time for the addition of this long-needed turn lane. If there's going to be an overlay project, and, and the road is just horrible. It's washboards, very dangerous, some, some minor break, actually break up of the pavement. So uh, I would be remiss if I also failed to point out the absolute need of a turn lane at the intersection of Highway 136. And again, that's the highway that goes from Beatrice to Fairbury and this same 12-mile uh, Odell Blacktop Southwest 61st Road, both the north end of that 12 miles and the south end at Odell could sure use uh, turn lanes. Again, thank you for allowing my comments this morning, and thank you especially to Commissioner Gertis for responding to one of my notes that I sent to a number of people as indicated in the supplementary document. And also Senator Dorn, <clears throat> Dorn was kind enough to call me back, I believe just yesterday for a, for a brief discussion. So I'm very happy with the response I've gotten from state officials. And again, this is just simply an FYI. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions for Mr. Anderson? Uh, we have received all of this. In fact, I think I'm not sure of anybody in the department that doesn't have one. <laughs> I tried to be rather thorough. I, I, I did a very nice job. And in fact, just as we were speaking, I got the, I, we, we send it over to the right people to do the analysis for the turn lane pavement condition and uh, all the things that, that you ask. And I have a draft copy, draft letter to you sent to me as we were just sitting here. So the team is working on it and we'll work get to you probably early next week um, about what our thoughts are on the, on the area. We have our traffic engineering looking at the, uh, the viability of the phone plane. And then of course our uh, we're going to do a potentially a 28 foot top in that whole area to provide a little bit extra room, but you will get our response very soon. I understand there's some preliminary plan planning been going on and it is in the works. And um, again, very appreciative of that. Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming forward. Yes, thank you for uh, coming up and presenting this information to the department. Um, the next last thing on the agenda, almost the last thing, is remarks from the chair. I have a few, but brief ones. Uh, first of all, I would, in behalf of myself and, and the commission, I'd like to thank uh, John Selmer for his uh, services director, his work and his dedication uh, uh, for us for the last uh, several years, including the uh, completion of the South Lincoln Beltway and of which was dedicated on December 14th, which turned out to be one of the Colder days of <laughs> September, only worse by the next uh, polar vortex the following week. 
but already I think we've seen a lot of good things from the uh, opening of the South Lincoln Beltway, excluding a few people and trucks might have been confused about actually getting on and off of the Beltway, but already you see very a, a marked decrease of trucks on uh, Highway 2 going through Lincoln. I think people are happy about that. And I noted driving in, because that's the route I take, I only I saw zero trucks, yes. zero trucks on the Nebraska Parkway, which is the name of that. And then the, the last thing I'd like to talk a little bit about the safety. And unfortunately, uh, 2022 ended up being one of the highest um, death tolls um, since 2009. I think in 2022 we had 254. And back in 2007, sorry, 2007, we had 256. So this is not a good trend. But uh, recently, there's been, um, let's see what company, AccuSensor did a report on seatbelt and phone use in Nebraska. And it came out as the highest non-use rate we have seen in the U.S. So that wasn't a good thing to hear either. So I think we... Uh, need to keep moving on with the um, buckle up, phone down, because it um, saves lives, and we just need to keep on that. So with that, I uh, next next meeting, we will welcome um, our new director, Vicki Kramer. And uh, with that, I that's all my remarks. All right, uh, as far as the public meetings calendar go, we do have a pre-construction meeting in Columbus. Um, the 23rd Street project is already in a, yeah, in a way again. Uh, that'll be on February 9th. And then March 24th is the next Highway Commission meeting that is in Omaha. And we'll be in the Exarvin Village for that time. So August 13th, that's after. Sneer shopping and the weather. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Are there any other items that need to come before the commission? If not, we need to check. Thank you. Thank you.